Hello, I'm Sarah Ferguson, author of On Mother, talking big ideas, little books for Hachette Australia. And it's a delight to welcome you to this um, Australia um, enterprise, which is really about talking to Hachette authors about work that they have written for us. And um, I should begin by explaining to our audience that, of course, you are a um, very well-known ABC journalist. You've uh, presented um, a documentary series on the killing season and written a book about that. You've also written and presented the Hitting Home series, which was a landmark series on domestic violence. You've presented the ABC 730 report and worked as a journalist on Four Corners, where you've won five Walkleys including the Gold Walkley in 2011 for A Bloody Business. You've won Melbourne Press Club Gold Quill Awards. You've won five Logies. The mantelpiece is full and it is a delight to welcome you here. Your latest project for the ABC has been the three-part television series Revelation about the Catholic Church and about the sexual abuse of children. And of course, you're writing a book for Hachette on that subject as well. But we're here to talk about the big ideas on a Little, in a little <laughs> book called On Mother. Mm. So you wrote On Mother only a few months after your mother died, two years on now from her death. Has the shock of her death um, and the aftermath of her death abated? It's abated. Everyone who's been through this experience knows that it, it changes, it alters. Um, somebody told me at the time, and I think I put this at the end of the essay, that you actually love your mother more as time goes by, if that were possible, and it's the case for me. Mm -hmm. And strangely, I hear her voice more clearly, more, more bell-like now than I did when she died and when she was apparently lost to me. So it, it, it changes, mm -hmm. it shifts. And after, straight after she died, you talked to her quite mm. a bit. Mm. Um, are you still talking to her? Yes, and, uh, and I think I hear her more clearly. Yes. But I used to, uh, I think I described this, I used to talk to her lying on my back in the water. Um, on the south coast of New South Wales mm -hmm. and took that splendid isolation to be able to talk to her in ways that maybe I hadn't and should have talked to her while she was still alive. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows who's lost anyone that one of the things you lose is, one of the things you lose are the endless conversations that you want to have and that's why final, it's the first time I really understood what finality mm -hmm. means. Although I'd lost other people, there's something about the end of your mother yes. that is a final moment mm -hmm. in its that is completely of its of its own genre. So tell us about Mrs. Ferguson. <laughs> I won't call her Marjorie as you do because I think she would object to that. That's right, definitely. And I think she's fair it's fair enough for her to object to it. So tell us about Mrs. Ferguson. Well, Mrs. Ferguson would find it completely priceless that we're sitting here talking about her and um, bringing her to the page was it was such an interesting thing because I think I said I think I said to you at the time that the thing about my mother is and my relationship with her is it's ordinary, it's plain, it's not full of, uh, full of drama and mm. um, breakups and coming together and um, repulsion and attraction. It seems to have been a fairly steady, fairly ordinary thing and I doubted for a moment that someone who was just a really good, kind, decent mother was enough of a thing to write about. And in the way of a great editor, you liberated me to understand that a simple good thing, and particularly perhaps in this world with all its, mm. with all its travails at the moment, that talking about s something that is simply good, that is love, was enough. Mm. So that's who she was. She was a, a woman of the English middle class of the post-war period with all that that contained. Um, an interesting woman with a certain detachment from, from people and a, a, really a desire to, to live just slightly withdrawn as if she were always observing what was going on around her. So we're very different people, mm. um, but there was a pureness to her love and to her honesty, which the older I get, the more I understand how above all other things that should be held. Mm. But you talk, it's interesting, because uh, I hadn't thought of that, that you talked about her slight detachment mm. and the capacity to observe, which of course is the craft of journalism. Yes, it? although I tend to throw myself at things more bodily, you know, and make a, a sort of me-sized hole in any wall that I see, whereas she, she was the, the mistress of detachment, so she could observe a scene and ob actually observed very well, where I would tend to roll up my sleeves and get down and dirty into the middle of it. Completely different ways of understanding the world, but I understand her ways better now that she's not here and sadly I can't tell her mm -hmm. that I understand better so to everybody who 
to anybody who wants to read on mother because they've lost their mother, that's one thing. But if you haven't, you get the tremendous advantage to not make all the mistakes I did. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we all make them all over uh, again and all again. All over again and again. It's so interesting though, that word lost. Mm. You know, we lose our parents, yes. we lose them. Well, we didn't lose them, it wasn't an accident. Mm. But, but it's a loss, isn't it? It yes. feels like we've misplaced them. That, yes. you know, that she'll be there at the end of the phone. Well, or, that's right, the, the, the idea that you can't pick Ring up the phone, mm. you can't hear the voice. I always thought it would be wonderful if you could just have, not a, not a kept recording, but if I could just have one more conversation oh, yeah. to ask a few things, all that sense of they must be, <clears throat> they must be here somewhere. They, they, they can't not be here. The notion of that finality is too extreme. Mm. And so you keep searching for them for such a long time because you think they must be there. Mm. You talked at the, just before about, um, you know, why am I writing mm. about something a, it's private and yes. it's not the journalist's sort of instinct mm. to write about what is private. It's not my instinct. No. Some, some, no, other, some, some other people like to write yes. about themselves. So endlessly. I hate to write about <laughs> myself. Yes. Yeah. You know, you don't put yourself no. in the story. Mm. And so that was sort of a challenge. Yes. Um, but then you actually brought your craft, the, you know, the craft and the metier of mm. uh, the journalist to understanding how she'd come to die. Yes. And so tell us about the aftermath. There was the trauma of yes. her dying, of the shock of her death. Yes. And then there's... So there's, two, so there's two things. There is, there is that great moment of human grief that, that we all will share one way or another. Um, so that was that to, to be able to write about that and think about it and capture it for all time is one of the, the biggest gifts I've ever been given. Um, but at the same time, there was an inquest into her death, and which I decided with my brother that we would conduct it ourselves and not have lawyers. So I, I, I had to switch at a certain moment from being a grieving daughter to a quite, in this instance, quite ferocious investigative journalist. And I remember the moment mm -hmm. where I received the report from the hospital. I read it, I read the description of her death. Um, the last thing she said is, um, my hands are clammy and cold, and which spoke immediately to the lack of care that was being given her at that moment. Um, when I first read the hospital report, I thought I'd completely overreached my, my capacity, that I couldn't possibly do that. And why had I been so foolish as to think that I could do it? In that moment, I thought I couldn't do it. And then I put it aside for a night and got up the next morning and became ferocious mm -hmm. and didn't stop until it was over. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of the inquest? It was, it was, it was good um, in that when it began, the, uh, the coroner, it was very clear from the opening of the coroner's remarks that um, she had accepted the hospital's position, which obviously was all about them not being sued subsequently, that they had played no role in her death, um, it was an accident, nothing, nothing, they had contributed in no way to her death, and the coroner was along that path and made that clear in her opening remarks. So I thought we were, we got off to a very bad start because I thought this is going to be very hard to turn her around. But at the very, at the end, she decided that she would not deliver the verdict that she had planned to, that she would deliver what's called a narrative verdict where she describes what happened. The advantage of that is, or the benefit, if you like, is that the hospital had to change its, the way it, it looked after people like my mother. She had a pulmonary embolism um, during a fairly standard operation. They had to change their, the way they look after people. So everybody mm -hmm. who loses someone wants it to mean something, not just the great human moment of grief, and for, it was good, but it was also for her. She would have wanted, lots of people said, don't do it, don't go to the inquest, it'll be awful. You'll have, to, you'll have to read things and see things and think about things you don't want to. But for her, I knew that she would expect me to stand up for her. She wouldn't want me to suffer, but she would want me to stand up for truth. And hospitals, like every institution everywhere, will do whatever they can to hide their mistakes. And it was my job to make sure that that didn't happen, that a small amount of truth was spoken. Mm -hmm. um, there was, in writing this, you talk about the grief you felt and it comes in waves and it comes at different moments, but also the th that you were left with the f terrible feeling that she'd been alone when she mm. died. Yes, for such a good, kind person, she hadn't told any of us in the family that she was going into hospital. Mm. The thought of her being alone, my brother called me from, uh, he was actually driving back from Italy trying to get back to England called me, told me that she died, and the thing that roared out of me was not alone, not mm. by herself, with no one who loved her around her. We should all die with love, mm. surrounded by love in some form or another. And she died, hands clammy, clammy and, cold, and cold, with no love, with just mm. people 
who were doing a job and after she died, they carry on as they must with the living and mm. not the dead, but it's for us to care for the living who then die mm. and you, it, should be, it should be all about love at that moment. Mm. These are the, the most intense moments of the human experience and no one should be alone. Mm. Do you think they're intense for the dying or do you think they're intense for the living? That's a, I've watched my parents both yes, die. And I've watched one die. Well, it depends. Your father died. Yes, you were it there depends how. It, it, it all depends. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I know. I a lot of it, it depends on medication. Yes, true, true. Um, that's but, true. But um, don't we all, in, in the same way that everybody beyond a certain point in their life is conscious, becomes conscious of the finite. So for many years, you're not conscious of the finite. The very opposite. Yes. You are <laughs> immortal, bathed in <laughs> infinity. Um, that's for our children. Yes. And then there is a point at which we we move over to something else. Mm. And so I can only imagine that that sense of the finite must become more intense. Mm. Now, people talk a lot about the moments leading up to death. Yes. It's a, you know, a fierce battleground mm. indeed of what is supposed to, what's, what's reasonable to happen in those moments. So, but the, the, understanding, the understanding that you have nothing, no time left to do the things mm. you wanted to do, to give more, to learn more, mm. to know more, to do better, I can only imagine that that must mm. play on the mind. Mm. But these days we don't, we die, you know, in a bathed in morphine, don't we? Well, Most of us, yes, you know, if we're lot. lucky, yes, if we're lucky. Yes. And there a must lot of be us. a period before the morphine when you know you're sick. So let's, yes. just, let's just bring the dying, yes, the moment of dying bathed in morphine, but um, if we extend it backwards, there's a moment, yeah, the, fini the finiteness the of yes, our lives, yes, for sure, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, you know, before you have to confront your mother's death, you've, um, you've been in terrible places and reported mm. on heartbreaking yes. Yes. tragedies, both mm. particular and individual mm. and social or community yes. or kind of, you know. Many. It's that difference, isn't it, between the tragedy writ large, and yes. we, you've seen it and reported on it, mm. brought it back to Australian viewers repeatedly of mm. your, in your professional life, and then this small moment, which is your own, which is just as significant. Yes, yeah, so what do you have to do? You have to free yourself to, um, to not compare them, and I had to do that in, 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 in writing about my mother's death. I had to make exactly that decision, which is to free myself to not make a comparison. I had seen have seen much greater suffering, but everybody's loss of their parents is their own intense moment of sadness, and you don't need to compare that to mm -hmm. bigger, wider, greater, mm -hmm. more outrageous suffering. It was mine, and it was enough. Mm -hmm. It was enough that I experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do love this story um, uh, uh, that you wrote um, when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. I think on pretty stationery if I, in my mind, I imagine. <laughs> You've I'm added on. the ponies, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah. Ponies, definitely the ponies, yeah. perhaps yeah. some flowers. Flowers, yes. <laughs> on Teenage Girls I can't have been so daft that I wrote on flowered notepaper. <laughs> no, but you I wouldn't like have been that picture. daft. But we like the picture. <laughs> to Philip Larkins, who yes. you were disturbed that he had such a bleak view of life, which I find hilarious. It's fantastic, isn't Tell it? Tell us about what, what prompted you to write so to Philip Larkins. So I love Larkins. poetry. I've always loved poetry, um, from, from the jumblies to, to now. And my head is full of poetry. Mm -hmm. And I have... A, I have lines for every occasion so it, it's one of the great sources of joy i had to learn a lot at school and then i learned a lot by myself and it's there forever so it is the greatest source of joy i got an english prize and it was philip larkin's collected verse and i loved it verse i'm sure it wasn't called verse um but <laughs> because i was a um, a superficial foolish teenager who hadn't yet understood that life can be terrible i was I was shocked by his bleak view of the world and even though I loved his formulations on love and relationships and so on as a teenager, I wasn't sure about that very bleak view that life is, is, is awful. Um, and so I thought the simplest thing to do was to look him up and write him a letter. So, so I did. But the great thing is that he replied. And so I wrote him a great big long screed about how life is really fine and it isn't how he <laughs> described it and he sent back a, sort of I can picture it, a sort of one and a half line reply which referred me to another poem life is first boredom then fear um so i what generosity what ge yes you know not not known for his generosity no. but he had he, you know he was sitting there in hull as the librarian he had time and like but, to but it is but how nice to know that it, it is generous of him absolutely correct and to direct you to another poem yes which yes. keeps you reading poetry which absolutely. is beautiful in itself absolutely. Isn't it? but i think i'd be quite amused at the thought of some 
you know, happy. Home, home counties, happy teenager cool. playing tennis, not understanding my poetry. I think he'd. But it's so beautiful. I think well, I'd he was. He had a bleak view of life. Well, yes. You were quite right. Yeah. You weren't not yeah. under. You were completely. I was right. Space. Just you just, were definitely right. I was just wrong about life. It's so beautiful. That's right. Life That's is right. complex. Yeah. Yeah. And you have some beautiful observations in here. One, in, in it's a very moving uh, essay. Um, but it's uh, and full of heart. But there's a mm. lovely observation. Nice to I'm, let your heart out. Just mm? just that once. It was nice to let my heart yes, out. Yes. Yes. But it was, um, um, you know, the uh, and the social etiquette around dying is mm. I've something I find um, uh, uh, riveting, riveting, hilarious. Yes. But you have a lovely. Um, it's not lovely. It's a very ast astute observation of a woman who arrived. I think it was an aunt who arrived mm. when your father was dying. Yeah. Your mother was at her dressing table, yeah. um, not knowing what to do, but mm. being there with the, you know, sitting there in a, you know, with her things, with with her husband her, as he yes, dies. Yes. And this woman comes in, and you yeah. call her the death catcher. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what what's the death catcher? Is it a, you know, I want some attention, or I'll be more important than anyone else in the in the moment. Of yes, the, so I think anybody who's gone through a slow death have, have, have seen those people that uh, that want to be there for the moment. You know, it's the starring role. It's like it's like right. people at funerals. You know, the the, mm. the, the, the chief mourner. <laughs> the chief mourner. Chief <laughs> mourner. There are there are people who um, pick that moment to want to shine, mm -hmm. and death does attract very strange behaviour. Yes. And I think anybody who's been through a death knows immediately recognises those people who get it and those people who don't get it. And the don't get it's usually start off, and this happened in my case, by telling you all about the person they've lost. Mm -hmm. Of course it's in the forefront of your mind, but that moment of that grief is for that person, not for you. Mm -hmm. But I think because it's such an intense moment, humans have to rehearse it over and over again in order mm -hmm. to understand it. Maybe they should do that privately. Correct. <laughs> Some people Correct. will do it in the church, in the synagogue, in the, at the wake, yes. you know. Yes. But keep it, it yourself. Is. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's finish with, if I could mm -hmm. ask you to read the last It'll be a paragraph. How nice to revisit this. Before I left her house to return to Australia, I sat by myself in the sitting room for the last time, searching for something in the stillness. Then I stood up and kissed each of the walls, an African custom. Back home, her flower bed had flourished. A dahlia I didn't know we'd planted bloomed suddenly. The local gardener, who'd helped me make the bed, had tended the flowers in the summer heat. There was a second flowering of the white hollyhocks, which filled me with delight. I can hear her voice a little more now. I dreamt she helped me unpack her sideboard with its plates and bowls from Nigeria, sitting next to me full of kind advice that I couldn't remember in the morning, but I had heard her clearly. An otherwise friend told me, we love our mothers more as the years pass after they've died. I think she's right. I realise now how like her I am. I look like her. I sound like her. I am like her. Our lives have been lived so differently, but all the good things she knew, she passed on quietly when I wasn't looking, when I was so convinced I was independent and utterly different. All along, I was hearing what she said and taking it in. I don't apologise for being sad anymore, but I do tell everyone to call their mother. I'm sure some of my facts are wrong, and I know if Anthony were to tell the story of our mother, it would come out differently. But we love her together, the Queen of England, our gentle-hearted Marjorie.